let me begin by first, in fact, uh, giving you a small bit of trivia. I think not many are aware in this room that the Honorable Minister's office, if you were to approach it in electronics, Niketan, you would find on the right-hand side a countdown timer, which gives him a sense of the time that is available to him to achieve some of those targets. And it is in keeping with that timeline. I remember I was here and I asked the Honorable Minister the question as to when can we expect uh, the bill and he responded by saying that wait till the end of the month uh, you'll have more clarity and if ISPP wishes so we could perhaps be here discussing it. Uh, so here we are uh, pretty much as for the timelines that he had prescribed. Uh, the bill came out on 17th November. It gave us a lot of clarity on the way forward. Uh, let me first begin uh, sir by asking that at the time when, you had, when we had last spoken here you had suggested that the current framework uh, that we have in place that was in Parliament and then was subsequently withdrawn was one very complicated uh, uh, did not very uh, uh, did not read very easily uh, required legal experts to unwind the jargon it was too wide in its scope that has been narrowed down 90 clauses have been brought down to 30 uh, there is also uh, quite many aspects of it has been uh, written about more recently which talks about how there are norms that have been relaxed so whether that's data localization or whether there are some aspects of exemptions deemed consent all of these aspects have been held uh, in the public conversation to be pro-technology, pro-innovation. Are you satisfied with the process of bringing down the complex legislation that we had earlier to the draft that we have now? No, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, like I said, uh, I, I think you correctly say that I said this in the last time we were here, that the reasons for the repeal of the previous bill was, A, it went far beyond data protection and it had got into internet regulation, social media regulation and all of those issues and therefore it needed to come back to what the bread and butter objective was which is really to protect the rights of our consumers without impacting the innovation ecosystem, without impacting the government's right to better governance. That was one and the second is like I said, we want very importantly post-COVID the momentum of our digital economy, we really want uh, these bills not to be something between parliament and a minister and a few bureaucrats. It, we really want the DNA and the architecture of all of these legislations, rules, to be built in a sense, uh, this Sabka Prayas idea of the prime minister with the industry, with public policy makers, with people who have views on this about what the future will be, and really make this a crowdsourced sort of a model for legislation. So I think simplicity, and having multiple stakeholders be involved in the legislative process, creating the architecture and design of the law is what our out outcomes were. And uh, I think this bill meets the, b those objectives uh, beautifully. Well, just to get into the specifics, there are some aspects which have seen relaxations. So whether that's data storage, localization, uh, also non-personal data not being included, these are aspects which many have said are pro-innovation, are pro-technology, will help uh, create that sandbox environment that enables uh, free thinking, innovation and creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, just your thoughts on that. No, no, Ashwin, if you re recall, and I, I take, uh, uh, you know, some effort at repeating, uh, because these things tend to get forgotten in, in the heat of the moment, that what we are doing is creating a framework. So we have the national data governance framework policy that addresses non-personal data and all of the downstream economic activities and research activities in AI and uh, innovation ecosystems, AI startups, that comes from the non-personal ecosystem. That has been framed, that has gone through consultation. You are aware of that, and that is now policy. We have now this law which deals with very narrowly digital personal data. And the digital personal data architecture is, like I, I explained, is about the rights of the data principle, which is a citizen, the obligations of the companies that actually deal with, uh, with processing the data and providing a reciprocal service or product, what are their obligations, and how does one deal with the breach of an obligation under the law, which is the data protection board. So this is an extremely narrow, very focused piece of legislation that addresses one particular slice of the digital ecosystem. And as I said, and I'm saying again, we are building the whole framework for the India tech aid. So we have NDGFP, we have the uh, DPDB bill, we will have a DIA subsequently, and while the DIA is being constructed, we have the amended IT rules as a placeholder before that. So uh, I, I say again, and I, you know, I just shared with the students here, that, uh, and, and I say this not just because I want people to know, I want you also to know that we have, we approach this as a framework. 
and we approach this as design principles. So uh, this is one piece of an elaborate legislative framework that we are building, of, uh, an architecture that we are building that will address almost every element of the digital ecosystem, not necessarily in one cumbersome, huge law, but in multiple pieces that are all harmonized. So there'll be harmonized pieces that will deal with uh, these various aspects. Uh, speaking of that framework, uh, this bill not only confines itself to the personal uh, uh, data, yeah. but also digital personal data. One aspect that has been raised in public commentary that we have seen is that non-digital personal data is not included in the scope of the bill. Does that then perhaps uh, create an issue where uh, companies may be compelled to keep the information in a non-digital format so as to escape uh, the legislation? No, I, I don't think you mean non-personal, uh, digital, non -digital, non-digital personal, non -digital data. personal data. Uh, look, and the, and the reason for that is very simple, that that is too vast a uh, thing to get into in the first bite, number one. METI, the, the, the department of which I am a minister, deals with only the digital ecosystem. Now, uh, we can't be legislating for the non-digital ecosystem as much as we would like to or we want to or you want us to. Uh, so I think this is, like I, I repeat again, in the digital space, laws and jurisprudence must be seen as evolutionary, always evolving. Uh, the world is, by the way, dealing with the same kind of challenges all over the world. Uh, we are way ahead of the curve in compared to many other countries in terms of our framework and laws and IT rules. So understand that this is not the last word on laws, this is not the last word on legislation or rules. These things will keep evolving. And I, I can preempt one of your questions, which is to say, why do you have so much of subordinate legislation in the rule, in the in the law? And precisely for that. Because as we go through, understand, learn the landscape of challenges and opportunities. There is a need for the law to constantly respond to turn left, turn right, change, uh, modulate, evolve. And that is why we have kept the, the DNA, the design principle of this law, that it can continue to evolve. Sure. Uh, that every time we see a challenge, we don't need to come rushing back and spend another six months in consultation and doing another law. That's an interesting point. In fact, uh, one of the experts uh, on the channel had suggested something along those lines. And uh, the conversation at that time traveled to that these are, of course, notifications. There are remedies and law people have. Yeah. Uh, so it's not. And by the way, I want to say this, and maybe people, uh, some people get it and some people don't, that subordinate legislation is not a free pass. Hmm. Subordinate legislations have to be placed in parliament. Sure. Like the amended IT rules, I will place in parliament during the winter session. I have to place it in parliament and I have to, if people ask me questions about it, I have to explain it. So subordinate legislation for, I mean, I, I read so-called experts uh, uh, write uh, some commentary saying subordinate legislation is bad because it is a free pass to the executive. It is not. Uh, I want everybody to understand the subordinate legislation goes through precisely the same type of parliamentary scrutiny that a law goes through. It is just not voted on. That's all. Sure. Uh, let's travel further to one of the aspects that you'd highlighted in the keynote speech uh, is that just prior to the bill, uh, there was a tweet of yours that went viral which red flagged Google's conduct in the United States. Uh, Google, just for the benefit of the, uh, the audience, uh, they were found tracking user location even when that user location function had been disabled. Now, this was charges were leveled by 40 states in the US. Uh, they didn't concede to any foul play, Google, but they readily agreed to pay a settlement sum of $392 million. Uh, the question I want to ask is, as far as the penal clause in the draft is concerned, uh, we've seen the very clearly laid out in Schedule 1 what these offenses are and what the relevant penalties could be. Right. The maximum penalty that can be levied is 500 crores. The question I want to ask is where we have a scenario where Google is happily paying 30,000 crores in the United States. Could this be a situation where perhaps this is... This would only be a wrap on the knuckles that Google will be more than happy to sign off as a Look, business expense. I, again, I would encourage people to read the bill. The 500 crore is a starting point. Mm. Uh, and it could be easily changed by notification by the government to after the DPB says, look, 500 crores is not enough, the harm is more, that we can make it 1 lakh crores if that's what is required. Also, let me also uh, put in your mind that it is not, it is, the law is silent today and therefore the DPB has the, uh, the discretion of that 500 crore being levied on a per subscriber, per consumer basis, or for the entire breach. Mm -hmm. So arguably, if there is a terrible breach and a total case of absolute negligence mm -hmm. or misuse of data, as the case may be, 
uh, and the DPB see, see, seeks to give them more than a rap on the knuckle mm -hmm. and really wants a punitive uh, message to go out there, that number of 500 can be multiplied by the number of subscribers or consumers that the platform has. So there is plenty of leeway for this not to be a rap on the knuckles, and it is not intended to be a rap on the knuckles. I want to be very, very clear. This, the reason criminalization has been moved out of the bill, mm -hmm. and it has been decriminalized, and we have relied on financial penalties, is that the financial cost of data breaches, financial cost of misusing Indian customers' data, Indian consumers' data, the financial cost of uh, compromising or negligence on the, uh, of Indian consumers' data will be so severe that you will not even do anything other than maintain the Indian customers' data with trust, Indian citizens' data with trust and responsibility. That is the intention of the bill. Mm -hmm. So if any platform believes that uh, I can play games with this and by the way, it's only going to be 500 crores, I want to, through you, give them the unambiguous message that that is not the intention. Uh, the consequences are designed to be a deterrent. Mm -hmm. The consequences are designed to change behavior. The, uh, the penalty section is designed to make sure that it is a punitive message that there are costs and consequences of negligence. I think that's a very welcome point that the criminality aspect has been uh, dispensed with. And sp speaking on the penalty, however, would you have liked it to have been benchmarked against the revenue like we have in the GDPR, like in the earlier Avtar of the bill, which says 4% of uh, Ashman, I the I want to say one thing. I, I, and I, I say this almost uh, uh, to collectively. We must agree that laws prescribe principles. And the institution of the Data Protection Board, which was always going to be under the oversight of a high court, evolves into making the right decisions on whether they will levy penalties based on the turnover, based on a 500 crore lump sum. We should not hard code that in law. Sure. We should not prescribe the prescription, but we should clearly establish the principle that our Indian citizens' data cannot be misused. Sure. Our Indian, data's, Indian citizens' data must be protected. And if you don't do A and B, the consequences under the law is that you will end up having a significant financial penalty. The Data Protection Board as an institution should develop into one with the required capacity and capability to take the right decisions on how to formulate the damage, how to calculate the exact amount, whether it is as a percentage of revenue, whether it's a percentage of the damage, or the consequence of the breach. That is something we should allow the institution to develop and build that capability and capacity. Right. So on that note, let's slip into a very short break. We'll continue this conversation with the minister, uh, with the Minister of State for Electronics and IT on the other side. Well, welcome back to this special broadcast on CNBC TV 18. We're in conversation uh, with Mr. Chandra Shekhar, the Minister of State for Elect Electronics and IT. Uh, we're discussing aspects of the data protection bill, the draft which is out already, and what it could look like in the days, weeks, and months to come. Uh, Mr. Minister, on to another aspect that was that saw very fierce debate in the public as well as in the parliamentary committee was should the government have an exemption? Uh, so section 35 was very fiercely debated. It's been dispensed with. Uh, the government, however, has reserved the power that in case a situation arises, it can notify exemptions to certain government entities. Right. Uh, this uh, has also seen a fair bit of criticism with, uh, I, if I recall correctly, Justice Shri Krishna uh, saying that this could be tantamount to a blank check. Uh, to the governments, and no, that no. raises concerns. One of the things I advise people, uh, justices and otherwise, is please read. You know, the, the best cure to misinformation is to read the document. Uh, and there is no such blank check anywhere. As a matter of fact, we have a section that says exemptions. And it is very open, it is very transparent, and the logic for that section of exemptions is laid out. It says that the, the, the exemptions will be for national security, it will be for uh, uh, natural disasters, and it will be a pandemic. Now, I can't believe uh, that any judge or a lawyer or a self-acknowledged expert will say, in the event of a pandemic, the government should go seeking consent from people who are trapped in a pandemic for the right to use the data. So, look, there will be criticism. Many of it will be just based on, you know, paranoia and conspiracy theories and the desire to be seen as opposing something, which is fine. This is our, we are a, a great democracy and uh, you know, we, 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 we welcome that. 
But to the people who want to make a constructive contribution and be co-architects of this bill, I point to the fact, and this is a fact, that all fundamental rights have reasonable restrictions. Uh, 19, which is Article 19, free speech has reasonable restrictions on 19.2 on law and order incitement. Similarly, the privacy and data protection rights have reasonable restrictions, which is that the government has the ability during emergencies to seek an exemption of the act. And we have laid out that very transparently the exemption section. We have not hidden it anywhere in some uh, you know uh, minor language uh, you know with uh, uh, convoluted uh, ifs and buts and so on. We, we are putting it out there, and it can be tested. It can be read again, read again. But I can certainly say that the characterization that this is some way of a free pass to the government is about as far from the truth as uh, uh, you know as you can get. It is not at all a free pass. The government's rights here are absolutely carefully designed, and they are absolutely, like I said, meeting the test of a reasonably uh, given right. And, and I want to tell you, during the Putuswami judgment, there were three conditions imposed by the Supreme Court for any law. Sure. It was legality, it was about necessity, and it was about proportionality. And I can assure you that the rights that have been given here meet the test of necessity and proportionality. Just two more questions I'll ask uh, uh, the Honorable Minister. Uh, with respect to, you said the Data Protection Board, that will be an institution going forward that will uh, decide the fate of uh, data protection. Uh, the question I just wanted to ask uh, is that, could it have been uh, more qualifications, more details in terms of appointment process uh, been clarified that would have given more Look, clarity on the I, way forward? Ashmit, I actually think that we must all agree that the old way of lawmaking where 30% of the law was, 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 was sort of set aside to describe the qualification of the chairman, his retirement age, and the descri describing the qualifications of the other members, their retirement age, their perquisites, how much cars they will get, what kind of house they will have. That used to occupy 30% of every old bill. This is a new way forward. We are describing and defining the institution, the DPB, and what the institution will do. We believe this law is required for the, for the uh, advance of our technology economy and the digital economy. The best people that are required for that kind of position, wherever they come from, and maybe it's, maybe it's you, uh, uh, or people from the media, should be available for that. Why should we create these hard-coded, prescriptive, uh, legislations where we will say the person has to be 59 years and a half and he should have a four bedroom bungalow in uh, Latians Delhi and he should have an ambassador car with the uh, air conditioner in the front and the back I think those are those are all past those are relics of a system that we we want to leave behind and move forward this is the digital age that's why we talked about the DPB being a digitally enabled board yeah. Uh, we have talked about that in the context of the GSE as well. Uh, it is not important who comes in as much as what the efficacy and the performance of the institution is. And to those who say it is not an independent regulator, it should be an independent regulator, the answer is very simple. Look, it is overseen by the high courts. If there is anybody who is going to oversee and scrutinize the decisions of the DPB, it's not you and me. It is not the government. It is not a student, the ISPB. It is the high court of the land that will sit in judgment or every decision that the DPP takes. And therefore, there's an inbuilt incentive for the DPB and those who are manning the DPB to be independent, transparent, and to be fair and equitable. I think the Honorable Minister is too wise to our ways. He already preempted the question. I know the question. Just like last time. One final question. I'll make this very brief. You gave us a timeline last time. Before November is when the draft can be expected. Now that the draft is here, the final uh, date for comments is December 17th. When do we see it in the parliament? No, is it the budget uh, session? Please, please understand there is no final date for comments. Mm -hmm. uh, we will extend the consultation. We'll continue consultation. We want this bill to be a bill that actually achieves its objective. And uh, so don't worry about the December 17, that is part of the bureaucratic process that somebody has to put a date there. But uh, at the end of the day, I welcome uh, this audience, students, uh, and especially students all over the country to participate in this. Uh, instead of leaving it to self-appointed experts, and I use the word experts in quotes, you become the experts. Read it, 
because I want as many Indian citizens who read this uh, to become experts on this and give us your views, give us your comments on how to make it better, if there is a way to make it better. But can we see it in the budget session or the monsoon session? Is more reasonable? I see no reason why we can't, we can't bring it in the budget session. I see no reason at this stage unless somebody comes up with something absolu absolutely, uh, you know, dramatically something that we've overlooked. And I suspect that there is not no such thing that we've, uh, we've our homework has been fairly <laughs> rigorous on this. Right, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, like always, uh, any 15, 20 minutes spent with you uh, always makes for an engaging conversation. I'd like to thank you uh, once again for taking time out, uh, for graciously answering some of our questions and for engaging us as well. Uh, also, at the same time, uh, let me thank here the students and the administration uh, at the Indian School for Public Policy for hosting uh, not just the minister but also us as well uh, for allowing us this platform and to having uh, this discussion. It's been a fruitful, engaging conversation. Uh, that will hopefully uh, drive the agenda going forward. Uh, but that is all the time that we have for. For more news and updates, keep watching CNBC TV 18. Hey Rahul, what's up? Hey, kicked about our first date?